Hey, deserving listeners, this episode is brought to you by Talkspace. Talkspace is uh, an ongoing sponsor of the show, and uh, they they were not a sponsor for a number of months, and now they're back. So it'd be really great if you went to Talkspace.com and use the promo code Kirk. You have to use the promo code Kirk when, when you sign up. Not only does that give you a discount, but it also signals to them that you're one of my listeners, which means that they're more likely to continue that sponsorship, which is kind of a big deal for the podcast. Online therapy has its pros and its cons, just like in office therapy does. Um, I recently had Irvin Yalom on the podcast, one of my heroes. Uh, one of uh, He's a hero to a lot of therapists. And he at first thought online therapy was ridiculous, but has since come around and is now not only endorsing and, and accepting of online therapy, but even works for Talkspace. He has some, he's some sort of contractor with them right now, so he, he's, he's fully into it. And, and if that doesn't tell you that there's some value to it, I don't know what does. So if you're, if you're interested, you want to try it out, it, it's, it's relatively cheaper than in-office therapy. So if you're looking for a therapist and you just want to see what it's like, I, I think it's you know, definitely worth a try, particularly because we're having a sponsorship program. So go to, go to Talkspace.com, use the promo code Kirk. The, the online therapist is uh, a legit fully, ther- fully licensed therapist. They are trained in the mode of online therapy. And the difference with online therapy is you get to you get potentially talk with them um, every day or almost every day. Um, and that frequent contact has its, has its benefits, you know. And so uh, if you're traveling a lot or it's hard for you to find a good therapist, the other nice thing about Talkspace, I would imagine, is like, if you don't really click with one of the Talkspace therapists, you can just ask for a different therapist on Talkspace because it's you know it's just a matter of making that request, I think, and and so that can make it easier to shop around, I guess, right? Anyway, Talkspace.com. Make sure that you use the promo code Kirk. All right, back to the show. Hey, deserving listeners. We had a great response to a recent episode in which we had Yuval on the podcast talking about evolutionary psychology. And so I thought I'd have him back. Welcome back to the podcast, Yuval. Thanks for having me. This is the Psychology in Seattle podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Kirk Honda. I'm a therapist and and a professor. Can you introduce yourself in medium length, Yuval, please? (laughs) Sure. So my name is Yuval Laor, and uh, I have a PhD in culture studies from the University of Tel Aviv. I wrote about the evolution of the capacity for fervor. Right, we talked about that last time in which you uh, explained how, um, well, I don't even want to attempt to (laughs) briefly summarize it, but well, let me try. So uh, we evolved a long time ago as mammals to have love for romantic partners and children. And as we developed language and the ability for to, to think about abstract ideas, we uh, soon, I guess, that love of uh, children and romantic partners became um, directed towards ideas, and that. And your dissertation was uh, looking at the state of fervor in, in relation to that love of ideas and and how it manifests. Yeah, so- so fervor is the, the infatuated state, which, which there is an infatuated state for both romantic and parental love. But of course, we have many other kinds of love, uh, child to parent, we love objects, we love our country, we love God, we love all sorts of things. But um, yeah, it's, uh, my argument is there's a new type of love and one where the commitment is also to a set of ideas, the underlying emotion is awe, the establishment the sort of the sudden falling in love which doesn't always occur but can occur uh in both parental and romantic contexts is uh uh, similar to religious conversion the sudden religious conversion there's also slow religious conversion so uh yeah that's what i wrote my my phd about and what's what i'm writing a book about right now so yeah and the fascinating part about it to me that was enlightening is the idea that trying to convince somebody that their religion is 
wrongheaded or their political opinion is wrongheaded or their uh, love of their country in a certain way is wrongheaded is like trying to get someone to fall out of love with their spouse or their children. Yeah. Or it's, it's a sensitivity to criticism. It's not falling. Yeah. It's, it's as if you're criticizing their, their baby. Right. They're right. It's like they're extreme. You know, we, we all know and expect parents to be partial towards their own children and to almost be blind to the negative qualities of their children. And yeah. that's okay. That's, that's, that's the way you want parents to be. Uh, not yeah. maybe well, the, the blind spots can also, you know, lead people to make horrible mistakes in romantic context. So, right, right. Yeah. But we expect that and we accept it and we think it's normal. And yet when we see people having blind spots and sort of blind affection and commitment to ideas and political opinions and religions and whatnot, we think, what, why are you doing that? Just change your mind. You know, it's so obvious that yeah. it's wrongheaded. And, and what you're pointing out is that that is, um, you know, it's akin to asking someone to turn on their own children. Yeah. And, and uh, it's many times it's a blind spot, but later it turns into willful ignorance where people don't choose not to see the faults in their ideology or their romantic partner or their, their children. Um, yeah. So, and of course we can talk all day about, about that subject and maybe, maybe we will. Cause I think last time I, I, uh, you know, meandered around and give it a proper systematic, uh, treatment. Well, the topic is large and requires yes. some meandering. You wanted to sure. talk today about the handicap, um, uh, principle principle. Uh, tell yes. us about that. So this is uh, uh, because you're interested in, in evolutionary psychology and uh, you recently did the, uh, uh, a podcast stating that you will not do any more about evolutionary psychology. This is um, uh, uh, an aspect of evolution and also evolutionary psychology that is concerned with communication as a specific subset of evolution and that there's many uh, specific dynamics that happen in the evolution of communication that are really interesting and fascinating and not trivial. Interesting. Yeah. Um, I, I want to hear more about that and how it relates to, to animals and including humans. Uh, yeah. But just a comment on the, the, so I've, I've been, I dipped into evolutionary psychology as a topic, I don't know, five years ago or something. And, decided to make some podcasts about what I had found. And I thought back then that it would just be like, cause I, you know, I've made 700 plus episodes on various different topics mm -hmm. and I just thought it'd be just, you know, one of those other episodes that I made, but I got so much response and arguing with me and, um, and agreeing with me and, and, and then people started contacting me to talk about, uh, different things on other podcasts and radio shows and, and comment on articles and stuff. And I, I just found like, wow, I didn't realize evolutionary psychology was such a hot button issue. So occasionally I keep dipping into it. And for the most part, a lot of people don't like what I say because I kind of take a, 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 a position that isn't as educated as yours, but similar to you. And I, and I'm guessing you know, you run into this too, where, you know, you're at a party and someone says, Ooh, I read this article that we evolved to blank. And you just sort of roll your eyes. Cause you're like, I, I highly doubt that that's been demonstrated sufficiently to be convincing. Yeah. And, and it's many, many misguided, just the whole framework, but it's the fault of many problematic uh, theories within evolutionary psychology, which I think have been debunked and, uh, uh are, are, are not serious, but I just returned from a conference, uh, the cultic studies, uh, international cultic studies association conference. And yeah, I heard in lectures, people, whenever people were referring to evolutionary psychology, which I'm all for as a subject, but they were, uh, always, uh, uh citing usually modularist, uh, Cosmetis and Tubi, uh, 92, uh, a version of ev evolutionary psychology, which, I think is just wrong. So. Right. And, and from what I understand, all the top thinkers in 
um, what we could call evolutionary psychology and its various other terms will agree with that. They'll say that that model doesn't make any sense. It's too reductive. It's, um, it's too separate from culture and epigenetics and everything. And so, Mm -hmm. and you know, it's complex. And so over time I've, I've, made follow-up episodes and gotten in arguments with my co-hosts and, you know, been the bummer at the party or someone who's just biting my tongue. And, and, um, and so I, what finally, I got another email up from someone and asking me to talk about evolutionary psychology again. And so I was just so fed up with my life in evolutionary psychology that I, I just, I, I, as a joke, mostly I said, this will be the last time we ever talk about it, but I was fairly certain we were going to talk about it again. And then I thought it was comical that it, it coincided with me publishing uh, your episode directly after that episode in which we talked about evolutionary psychology. So, yeah, so I'm, I'm fine with it, but, um, <laughs> uh, yeah. So are you ever at a dinner party or talking with friends or family and and someone starts talking about evolutionary psychology and you have to make that choice as to whether or not you want to be the, the bummer. Uh, yeah, of course that happens. And, uh, sometimes it's even worse. Sometimes people, uh, you know, believe in a thing called mimetics, which is completely ridiculous. What's that? Mimetics. It's a theory, uh, uh proposed by Richard Dawkins in, uh, I think in 1982 in the extended phenotype where he, uh, he has his theory about how genes work, which is also debunked and, and completely not, not true in any way, the, the selfish gene theory. Um, and he uh, argues that culture also functions in a similar dynamic to the way he imagines genes to work, and that they're, um, it's like cultural atoms or cu- cultural replicators, which are memes and that they replicate each other and that this is all explains all of culture that culture has evolved over time as a replication of certain ideas so instead of genes you have memes yeah and the memes they are also represented as being selfish so uh if a, a meme for example might be a joke and if it is a successful meme that it uh uh makes the host which is the person uh, tell the, that joke to others, so that that's the replication mechanism or the um, of of the meme that uh, uh, and that successful memes fight uh, each other, and that culture is the um, <laughs> comes about because of the this fight between memes within our minds. But right. that is, I can I can tell you many. Many, many problems with that theory, but uh, I mean, just just to, well, just to give the listeners a little another example is the idea of how to um, you know build a building in the best way. You know how to build a building, the strongest building. So a culture develops that technology, and that idea spreads. Yeah, to, uh, you know, many, many times canoes are used as an example. The best. Okay, right. So, so the the best canoe competes against the less yeah. best canoe, and over time, the best canoe ends up being reproduced, and the crappier canoe uh, dies sure. off. It's similar yeah. to competition with um, with evolution and animals and plants and stuff. Yeah, but it 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 completely, and and there are certain situations where that kind of algorithm that kind of mechanism seems to uh, explain it but if you asked uh, um, uh, someone who believes in mimetics why is England Protestant rather than Catholic they would tell you that maybe the Protestant meme uh, outfought the the Catholic meme in the minds of different people in England but if you ask a historian they'll tell you that that's because Bloody Mary died of influenza uh, Mary the first that is Right, <laughs> and that is the reason. And Elizabeth the first was a Protestant, and so the the you know the only looking at ideas as if they don't interact with the world. And of course, the same idea would be accepted very differently if you're drunk, if you're a kid, if you've just seen a ghost. You know, all those 
uh, or and the source of it, if it's told to you by the Pope, if it's told to you by someone you trust, you don't trust, um, the idea that you can make an all else being equal uh, argument regarding memes, that all else being equal, change the, the meme and see what happens, that you cannot make those arguments because the all else will not be equal. So, and it denies yeah. power structure. Is that its main uh, authority? Yeah, authority. Yeah, and it it denies a, a, a bunch of things, but it denies the interaction between uh, uh, ideas in the world, ideas and emotions, for example. But uh, you have people like uh, Sam Harris uh, who believes in mimetics, and so he will tell you that. Uh, you know, Islam is a collection of bad ideas, but of course, first of all, a person can believe with all their heart in a set of ideas that they don't know what they are, right? You can believe that whatever is in the Bible is true, but not know what's in the Bible. And you can take the, the most important ideas that you believe in. For example, if you're a Christian uh, you, and you believe in the Bible, the Bible says that you must give all your money to the poor. And yet you can very easily ignore that. Uh, there are many Christians who do not give all their money to the poor. And so this idea that, that memes or ideas determine uh, um, our behavior and, our, and explaining them and their biases is an explanation of culture is, you know, it's, it's, I don't know what to do with that. It's a ridiculous notion. Yeah, I, I guess it's another example of someone who discovers something that's quite sound or that makes them a model, a way of thinking that applies to a particular part of nature that makes a lot of sense like genes and DNA and evolution. And then, <clears throat> and then really loving that idea and extending it into other areas that it doesn't necessarily apply yeah, to. But this is a strange, this is like a, a platonic extension. So Plato would tell you that to understand the best way to structure a city, we need to look into the soul and that the city would be analogous to the soul for some reason. It doesn't right. give you an explanation. And uh, uh, this idea that ideas and genes will be analogous, you know, it, it just seems like a, a strange thing to, <laughs> to, to assert and to extend it to such an unrelated or, you know, far different uh, um, uh, context and of course the, the claim is that ideas are re replicating but they're not replicating they're often reconstructing many times anyway there's yeah, yeah it reminds me of murray bowen he's a f pioneering family therapist and he I, from my uh, uh, guess he developed his theory of humans and families and psychology in his observation of the way families interact and, and how they have a, uh, he, he developed this model of thinking that they, they're trying to balance two different forces. One force is towards each other because they want intimacy and closeness and love. And another force is away from each other in which they want independence and separateness and mm -hmm. their own thinking thoughts and their, their own identity. And that families are constantly um, managing this, this, these two forces and trying to find a balance. And mm -hmm. when you have a problem, it's often because something's off balance. And that's a pretty useful metaphor. A lot of family therapists find it to be useful. Mm -hmm. And then he extended it to the entire universe. <laughs> he said, he said that all of life is in this balance between uh, going towards each other and going away from each other. You know, it, he, he, in fact, he called his um, theory, he didn't call it like family systems theory, he called it natural systems. And so he thought that all of life, you know, on the cellular low level, and then you have cosmology and everything is moving, you know, it, it reminds me of that, you know, when I yeah. lecture about it, I, I point out that Bowen was trying to explain the entire universe and, and, you know, we always get a little bit of a chuckle. I mean, it's fine. It's a metaphor, but it just kind of reminds me of that, that you mm -hmm. find something that's useful in yeah. your field and then you just sort of apply it to the entire universe. So maybe that's what Dawkins was doing. Uh, yeah. And Dawkins do doesn't write about it. He proposed it, but ever since then, other people like Susan Blackmore and other 
uh, uh, write, write books, they write articles, but Richard Dawkins doesn't uh, do so himself. So. so tell us about a handicap principle again. Okay, so sometimes this is also called, yeah, it's also sometimes called the Zahavi principle, named after Amot Zahavi, who passed away recently. Uh, he's the person that proposed it. He was also from the University of Tel Aviv. And uh, he came up with a, a, a fascinating theory about the evolution of communication. And it starts with the realization that for communication, you need trust. And trust is not uh, uh, automatic at all. So uh, if you take an example of communication between a leopard and an antelope, those are two animals that are trying to kill each other, right? The antelope is trying to starve the leopard and the leopard is trying to eat the antelope. And yet they can communicate uh, and, and trust each other. And they do that through what is called stoting, S-T-O-T-T-I-N-G. And uh, stoting is when the, the antelope sees the leopard from far away, the, the antelope jumps straight up and does those, those hops. Now, um, on the face of it, that is the exactly wrong thing to do when you see a leopard. You should save your energy and not expand your energy, not even, you know, you're not even running away, you're just jumping straight up and down. But what that says to the leopard is that uh, I saw you, right? So uh, the antelope says that it saw the leopard and that because it saw the leopard from far away, the leopard has no chance of catching him, catching the antelope. So if he started to chase the antelope now, they will just both get tired. None of them would benefit uh, from it. And so it's best if they don't chase and the same outcome, but saves energy for both sides. So the reason the leopard can trust this message that uh, the antelope uh, uh, is, is giving him is because it, this uh, display of jumping straight up and down is something that not every antelope can do. So if the antelope was sick or if it was injured or if it was uh, tired or, or starving, then it would not be able to jump straight up and down like that. And so if, you, if the leopard sees a group of 30 antelopes and 29 of them are jumping straight up and down and one of them is not, <laughs> because that one might be sick or injured, it can be seen as the other antelopes pointing out to the leopard which one he should go after, right? Yeah. So the reason trust was able to be established in this case is because the, the display, the jumping up and down, is something that not every antelope can do. Right. Okay? So... This has uh, all sorts of different implications. I can give you another example uh, that Zahavi gives before we continue uh, of uh, a falcon. I think it's a falcon. Maybe it's a hawk that is chasing two birds. And one of them is singing and one of them is not singing. And then they split away. The, the two birds diverge and the hawk will follow the one that was not singing. Because the one that, that was singing could always stop singing and, and fly faster. The one that wasn't singing might be at the very end of its energy. So that's the one he would go after. So it's a paradoxical thing where you do something that is wasteful, right? Jumping up and down, exerting energy or singing while you're running away from a hawk seems really the wrong thing to do. But we see it in nature and it makes sense in the context of the handicap principle. Now, uh, let me just point out that the handicap principle refers to handicap in the sense of like when you play golf or if you play chess without a, a piece, it's that kind of handicap. It's not, uh, you disabled. know, it's not disabled. Yeah. It's not a people, uh, you know, who are in wheelchairs. It's, um, it's handicapping yourself. So if yeah, you handicapping yourself and is right. that communicating, right. Uh, like boxing or, with one hand tied behind your back. That's sure, exactly. Yourself. Yeah. So, uh, that's what the, the handicap principle is named after. And it's, it's a problem because it's not a good name because of the, the, it sounds like you're talking about, about uh, people with disabilities. But, um, and there's other problems. The, the, his book, Zahavi's book, is, is not, he's, uh, he, he's not a very good uh, uh, writer or popularizer of his ideas, which is a problem. And, and it's the reason why a lot of people uh, don't understand 
uh, the principle the way the way they should. So um, the this principle in, in humans we see that in what is called conspicuous consumption, right? So that's uh, Vablen's uh, a, a book from you know 1900 or uh, about how humans a human might buy a sports car, which he would he there's no reason for him that he doesn't need a car that's just small you know uh but it is a handicap it is uh, a display that not everybody can do and so if if you do a cheap display for example having a shirt that says i am rich then anybody can do it so it's not believed or if the antelope used the cheap display for example just wiggle its ears whenever uh, uh it wants to signal to the leopard it would wiggle its ear, then that would be a, there would be no uh, trust. You, you cannot trust that uh, message because the antelope can do that all day. It's yeah. not a costly signal. Right. And it's something that everybody can do, even if you're injured. So it's um, only things that not everybody can do uh, will be impressive. Okay? Right. Yeah. Now, this is... Uh, the beginning. So, for example, the tail of the peacock uh, and the, the size of the tail of the peacock is uh, given as the, the quintessential example of the handicap principle where the peahens choose the, the peacock with the largest tail, even though that is that peacock uh, would have the most trouble surviving because he has to carry around that enormous tail, right? Right. And so... It can be said that the peacock tells the peahen, look, I am so uh, fit that I could even survive with this tail. Right. Okay. Now, the other aspect of the handicap principle, and in the case of the peacock, this is a runaway process that can lead at the end to the extinction of peacocks, right? Because the tails would go bigger and bigger and it would make them... Uh, worse and worse at flying and uh, easier to to hunt for predators and so you can it can lead to extinction but the handicap principle is about general communication in all contexts not just uh, uh, this and there is also the picture on the tail of the peacock or the pattern the colorful pattern and that does not go bigger and bigger that gets more and more specific so in this case, the handicap is not for being the biggest, but being the most specific uh, in, in a certain, uh, uh, certain pattern. Right. So, for example, uh, uh, Professor Zahavi would say that if you uh, go to a, a synagogue where, of Orthodox Jews, where they all dress exactly the same, they're all dressed exactly the same to be the best dressed person in the synagogue. So that, um, and this, this brings us to the first non-trivial aspect of the handicap principle is that to show that you are the best, sometimes you, you, uh, you need to do exactly what everybody else is doing. So to show that you're different, right? So for example, if you want to show that you're the fastest sprinter in the world, you cannot run 87 meters. You must run 100 meters so that you'll be comparable to other runners. Right. So the handicap principle has a uniforming uh, effect. It, it causes animals and, and displays to become uniform in, in various ways. So um, if you take the athlete, right, the, the athletes, we see three types of uniformity, right? To show that you're the best, you need to go to the Olympic Games. You cannot go, you know, to the parking lot outside the Olympic Games and sprint there because then... And, you see your uh, uniformity in the athletes. So the athletes become very similar looking to each other. They all have, you know, low body fat. They all have, you know, s similar musculature for whatever sport it is. Uh, you see a, s a similarity in the displays, right? So if a Martian came down and saw a hundred meter sprint, they would think, oh my God, everybody did the exact same thing. That guy shot the gun and they, they started running and they all ran exactly the same or in gymnastics, sometimes the difference is just who sticks the landing a little better or, uh, you know, the, the, uh, but it is the similarity that makes it possible to compare 
which makes it possible to determine who the best is. Okay. Right? Yeah. And the third uniformity is the uniformity in the observers. So the people in the audience, they all are uniform in their knowledge of the rules of the sport of the, uh, that they're observing so that they know who they need to credit for being the best, right? Right. So the, the handicap principle, so th that's one un unusual thing because the handicap principle is all about showing that you're different. Now, sometimes the handicap principle is about showing that you're good enough, right? There's also good enough uh, displays, but you have those in evolution in general. In evolution, sometimes the, the, the fittest is the one that's selected, but sometimes you just need to be fit enough to be selected. So for example, if you, uh, there's butterflies who are poisonous and they need to resemble each other so that predators know to avoid them. And they just need to resemble each other well enough. So once, if you got the right color and the right shape, sort of, and you're good enough, then you would not be eaten. You don't need to be the best. You don't need to be the most precise. Okay. And so the, it, it, all the people who dress the same, right? If you look at the Academy Awards and all the men dress exactly the same, right? They all wear tuxedos. Some of them might wear it just to be good enough, right? So I wore a tuxedo, but some of them would wear a tuxedo to be the best dressed. So they, and because a discerning eye could tell the difference between a, you know, a thousand dollar tuxedo and a $10,000 tuxedo. I assume <laughs> that they can tell the difference. Right. Uh, and so the handicap principle explains why you have uniformity in, in displays. Does that make sense? Because that, that's, a, that's a big thing. That's a big, important aspect in culture, right? Right. So it's not, so there's, there's two kinds of uniformity. One is, is like we um, evolved to have feet at, to, for optimal standing yeah. and walking. So we all have, you know, 10 toes or most of us do and blah, blah, blah. So that's one kind of uniform um, form that evolves but that's not the same as evolving a a, a tendency to um, conform to a particular handicapping you know for so when someone is displaying a, a t the best tuxedo they're they're kind of putting themselves out they're spending a lot they're spending a lot of money to prove that they have a lot of money or they're spending yeah. a lot of energy to prove that that yeah that they have energy to, to spend on that such thing or something. And that they're well-dressed and that they're of good taste, you yeah. know? The, um, yeah, so the wearing a suit to work, if you're, let's say, a lawyer, is, can be seen as a handicap. Now, with the handicaps, there's actually three types. There's one that's good enough, right? So I, everybody needs to wear a suit, so I'll wear a suit. Um, another type of handicap is when you're trying to be the best, Right? So I'm running at the Olympics to show that I am the fastest runner. Not that I'm good enough, but that I'm actually better than anybody, everybody else. And the third is trying to do exactly uh, the most precise thing. So that's not running at the Olympics, but that might be a bowling, where you're trying to be the most precise, uh, you know, or throwing darts. You're trying to do exactly what you did last time, or what the, the prescribed best outcome is. But you're trying to match it uh, uh exactly yeah there's a lot of elements in japanese art that and and just general trades and um uh, occupations that create something there's a long tradition of uh people trying to be the most precise and, and the most standard mm -hmm. you know if, if you're gonna make a piece of sushi and it, you have to make it in this exact particular way. Yeah. The closest you, to, uh, yeah, there's religious rituals that you need to do the most similar to some predetermined way to do it. You know, right. to, like, sing the national anthem, right? Or right. Right. Like the, the, right. The masters of the tea ceremony in Japan yeah. are not masters sure. because they, they put their own style into it. They're masters yeah. because they have mastered the precise prescribed tea ceremony. And yeah. So, yeah. And, and we will get that to that later because there is an element of creativity and probably there is also in the uh, uh, tea ceremony, but that's within uh, a context. So, uh, you know, we can, we can get that in a second, but 
let me, before we continue, give you two more non-trivial examples of okay. communication uh, with the handicap principle. So uh, one of them is uh, soldiers coordinating in World War I that they will uh, mutually miss each other. So people who are in different trenches, they're each trying to uh, shoot missiles into the other trench, but they can, uh, historically, we know that they would sometimes get agreements where I'll, we'll miss you and you'll miss us, okay? Right. So that is, but for that, you need to communicate with the enemy, with someone who's trying to kill you. So the way this would happen is that they would take the best gunner and that person would, would uh, uh, bomb a specific uh, tree or rock that's by the other trench that is seen, and they would hit it again and again uh, in a way that it is clear that this is not accidental. Interesting, okay? yeah. And so when you see, you know, the, the, the other side is bombing this tree again and again, very precisely, bringing their best gunner to most accurate to miss, then that might be a message that they're trying to give us. And so the other side would uh, uh, do the same. They would bomb the exact uh, uh, useless target, and that would establish. So, um, Did that happen in World War I? Yes. Interesting. And it had to be broken up continuously uh, by officers. So officers would, would break these things up. But uh, what, not anybody can bomb the same tree accurately again and again. So that's why you, it was a, uh, uh, the, the message carried the handicap. Right. So, because not everybody can do it and it uh, communicated worth. Uh, so that's, that's uh, one, one example. Another example is uh, also from the context of war is that there is a, there is a second century Jewish rebellion in Rome where the army Everybody to participate in the army, to be a soldier, you need to cut your pinky finger. Now, this is second century, so it's life-threatening procedure, but <clears throat> um, that seems completely contradictory to any common sense. Why would you cut a finger? Because, you know, we're, we're, we're trying to be a, the best soldiers we can, not, not uh, um, like mutilated. Cut, cut it off? Yeah, cut it off. And that, first of all, if you're a, a soldier in that army, you know that everybody around you is really committed. Right. If they cut a finger to be in this army, they're not just going to run away the first you know, bad thing happens. So you are very secure in the resolve of everybody in your army. And if you're a soldier that's facing that army, that is really scary. All of those guys are really serious. <laughs> they're willing to cut a finger to paint that army. They're, you know, they're badasses. So um, it's actually a very, uh, very useful thing to have everybody cut a finger. Right. Yeah, because it increases the solidarity. And of course, you have circumcision, which is a similar kind of, kind of thing. And there's many uh, uh, group rituals like fasting or that on, on the face of it look like they're hurting the people, but you know, what's the use of having everybody fast? Uh, but it's, uh, it functions that it has a handicap. It communicates, uh, the resolve. It communicates the, the, um, the, the fact that people are really committed to this. They're not just here because times are good and they will leave the minute times are bad. So those are examples of handicaps and there's, they're, they're all around us handicaps, but then there's weird things. So, for example, sometimes the same display, uh, the, uh, one display and its opposite can be a handicap. So having a BA, right, having finished a college degree is a handicap. It's something that not, not anybody can do, and it signals that you're, at least you can, you can do that, right? And actually, a, a, a person by the name of uh, Spence won a Nobel Prize in economics for saying this in 73. So, but not having a BA can also be a handicap when uh, among professors. So if you have a bunch of professors, one of them can gloat that I don't even have a BA. Right. Right. And it's because the, the, you're compared to a different group. So in the general population, having a BA 
is something you can boast about, but it, among professors, not having a BA is something that you can boast about. Because all prof- most professors have a BA. Yeah. So having sure. a BA among professors doesn't distinguish you at all. No, and, but not having one does. Right. Or not having a high school diploma. A friend of mine is a professor that doesn't have a high school diploma, and he can, he can boast about that. Right. Because not, you know, most professors do. Or if you're a Nobel Prize winner, you can boast about not having a PhD if you don't have one. Right. Right. Uh, so that, that's uh, uh, an interesting angle. And, for example, uh, uh, Pablo Picasso would paint paintings that are seemingly very easy to paint, right, in the early 20th century. He painted and people, it looked like ch- children's paintings, right? And people were outraged. People said, you know, if a child can paint it, that's, that's crap. But when they found out that Picasso was a master painter in every other style of painting, that he is a great master, and yet after that he chose to paint in a way that's really easy to paint, then he became very impressive. Interesting. Right? Yeah. So uh, painting... Uh, the way it is hard to paint, that can be a handicap. That can be a way to show off. But once you're a master, you can show off by painting like a five-year-old. Right. A friend of mine is, or a friend of a friend, is a artist. And he uh, creates, I'm sure he's done a lot of different projects over the years, but the, his current thing is he, with a pen, he draws little circles on a a huge canvas and he draws little like millions and millions of little circles and it it just ends up being and he doesn't even try to make it into a image it's just Mm -hmm. it's just it looks kind of like a dark abstract painting but then you get closer and you just see it's it's just ink and these you see all these little circles these tiny little circles and and he counts them as he does them on a calculator he like you know goes plus Mm -hmm. plus plus equals 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 you know for the whole time and and you know to make sure that or that he has a count for how many how many circles and so that's handicapping it's signaling that he um well he does something that not everybody can do right 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 and this is uh or also or what could or would tolerate doing or something yeah (laughs) <laughs> yeah, and so a, a lot of art is, is very, very difficult to do, of course. And if it was easy to do, it would not be as impressive, unless, of course, it is by someone who already did the hard stuff that now... So um, so, so, the, so a lot of art is, along these lines, is trying to signal that there's, you're distinct in your ability to tolerate a particular activity that most if not everyone else on the planet wouldn't be able to tolerate yeah so that that would be one one aspect of it some of it is a a talent so that you're really really good at motor coordination so you can hold the brush in a way that other people can't you know wield the brush so that could be a, a the handicap would be a skill that not everybody can do um but also the effort, uh, it, of course, the holding the brush indicates the effort you put into practicing, uh, you know, a, a, a painting. Um, but sometimes you can, uh, in certain circumstances, you can also have um, show off that you did something simple. But you can show off that you're poor. If you're someone like uh, the Buddha, or St. Francis, who come from a rich background but chose to be poor, then you can boast about it. Right. Right? Yeah. And, and they do. Of course, both St. Francis and, and the Buddha are, you know, showing off that they're poor. And that's only because they were previously rich. Right? So, so, how, have, so how does this relate, if at all, to evolutionary psychology and the, 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 that conversation? So, well, with, with in psychology, communication is a big aspect of psychology. Right. Right. And so whenever you have communication, the argument is that you're going to see some aspect of the handicap principle. And many times that can, can, can explain or illuminate why people are, are acting the way they do. Now, there's a, a, an important point that needs to be made is that I'm, I'm, what I'm saying is that handicaps are done to impress others. 
but that is only their evolutionary function. That doesn't mean that the, the artist, for example, is doing what they do to impress, right? In evolution, you don't need to know why you're doing things. So you, um, you don't need to know that, that uh, horniness or, or sexual, sexual behavior would lead to pregnancy. Right. Or that hunger is tied to nutrition. You just know that you're, you're hungry. So people can have the urge to create, to be creative. Sometimes they don't even display their, their, their art. Now that urge comes from the handicap principle. So it is because their ancestors who did act this, on this urge, had this urge, happened to have impressed other people and to have benefited from it. So we evolved a... Urge. An, an urge to be creative, to act in various ways that we also find depressive. In relation to those around us in, in, in many ways. Yeah, but the, it, it doesn't mean that you're consciously doing it, or it doesn't mean that, that uh, uh, you're, you're doing it to impress others. Right. It just means that the, it has evolved within that context. Right. But okay. if you ask why, why do people do art, you can say the handicap principle. Now, of course, that doesn't, uh, that explains things like artistic behavior, but also, you know, uh, academic excellence, right? Trying to show off that you have a, right, right degrees or whatever, that you're educated. Uh, I mean, a, a lot of our motivations are tied to the handicap principle. Yeah, I would say 99.9% .9 of our board. I mean, every every little thing, like, the way your house looks, the way your landscaping of your house looks, the your furniture, the, how thin you are, the kind yeah, of computer you exactly. have, the, so, the way you talk, how tall you are, the, your hair, uh, whether or not you shower, you know, it's just like everything we do. Yeah. The fact that we have and a job, you know. And it can explain podcasting. the people who do shower or do, do groom themselves, but it can also explain the people who don't groom themselves. Right. By the people who say, I, I don't need to shave my legs or a woman that would, you know, I'm so, uh, uh, and that can also be a handicap. Okay. Yeah. I just think of there's this, this one uh, example pops into my head in, in my life when I was growing up in the, you know, the Seattle area in the late seventies, early eighties, everyone wore Levi's jeans. I've talked mm -hmm. about this in the podcast before, but everyone wore the same kind of Levi jeans, the 501 red tag Levi jeans, everybody. Mm -hmm. And there was a time when I was in the fifth grade or fifth or sixth grade. And I was, I did a, just a mental count of how many people at, at my school were not wearing Levi's jeans. And there was like four people and I was one of those people and I felt really inadequate. And so I begged my parents to get me Levi's jeans uh, over time they eventually did and I went to school and I was I was one of the conforming you know I was I was that Japanese sushi artist trying to create the exact I was trying to you know precisely be fashionable yeah. or or, or you were, you were the guy who, who who became a lawyer and had to wear a suit right you're the exactly. guy that, yeah I'm, yeah I'm the but guy at the there Daniel could Moore. there could have been that among your four people that didn't wear the jeans some of you might have felt inadequate and you wanted to wear jeans but others might have done it as a way as a, to rebel i guarantee you none of us were in okay. that category we were all super nerds and had parents who didn't like levi's <laughs> jeans um and it wasn't long before everyone was wearing levi's jeans so <laughs> but then fast forward to uh, -huh. uh like three or four years later i'm in ninth grade in high school and before school started i I just thought about fashion and just thought about how everyone is conforming all the time. Like every, everyone just dresses exactly the same, you know, particularly the guys. Yeah. And so I made this uh, decision going into ninth grade. I wasn't going to wear jeans at all. That was like mm -hmm. one of the things, or I was never going to wear blue jeans. If I had, like I had a pair of pink jeans, I had a pair of white jeans and they were very weird looking, you know? Mm -hmm. And so I, uh, and then I just extended that all the way through high school in that I took pride in saying that I never wore a pair of blue jeans in high school uh, in, you know, 19, the late 1980s at a time in my community when 95% of boys and girls were wearing blue jeans, you know, it's just, so it was like I, I flipped from trying to conform as a way of handicapping to a, uh, it's trying to stick out, right? Mm -hmm.
yeah that's what comes to mind uh, um so the, that was that was me manifesting that urge that yeah that was the 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 yeah and the people who confirmed they all dressed the same to be the best dressed person right you know um michel foucault gives gives uh uh an, an example of uh at some point in the 19th century with the victorian ethics towards sexuality it be, uh, people stopped talking about sex right and when they did that, there are certain people who did talk about sex and they were suddenly, now they're avant-garde, they're rebels, they're dangerous, they're outsiders, they get all this, um, all this credit for doing something that, you know, everybody did before, right? Right. Just because uh, uh, of the situation. I, for example, when I lived in Israel, I'm an Israeli and I, now I live in Colorado. When I lived in Israel, I was... Uh, pro-Palestinian and a draft dodger. And uh, there was a camaraderie among the left, among people who thought that equality is a good thing. That it, just in America, if you hold those ideas, then you're just a regular person. But in Israel at, at, at the time and today, uh, you're, you're a rebel, you're an outsider, you're avant-garde. And so, you, yeah, you have the, this, this uh, a convergence uh, uh, to culture or being different dynamic that uh, I think is rooted in the handicap principle. In an attempt to gain sexual um, attention so that we can procreate? <laughs> yeah, so that is one kind of communication, right? Communication between the sexes. Or Earlier I talked about the communication between predator, oh, predator. and prey, right? Right, right. right. So what um, are we doing as humans when we're distinguishing ourselves or trying to conform to something perfectly what are we trying to get are we trying to procreate are we trying to protect ourselves are we trying to gain the well first of all we might not know or something <laughs> we might not know right so the, the handicap principle means that doesn't mean that you know why you're doing things but yes the 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 reason why we um uh uh you, you know uh conform to society right is uh, to be successful at, at work, to be successful, you know, to be liked by other people, to be uh, uh, sexually attractive, um, you know, the regular, the regular drives that people have. But the also being beautiful is a handicap. So that that's that's not clear. I mean, why just being pretty, you know, not not beautifying yourself, but. Um, for for Zahavi, and this is this is not trivial. A lot of people who write about the handicap principle don't don't uh, understand this nuance or don't don't talk about this nuance. Is that um, in general, uh, uh, the way Zahavi talks about it, and I think he's misleading because he himself would would contradict himself, is that the handicap uh, must carry a cost. Now, the problem is that the, the term cost is very tricky and uh, uh, non-trivial to define because there's different contexts, there's different, you know, some people for them to work out, is, uh, they, they pay a price, some people love it, you know, so they don't pay a price or, uh, you know. Uh, um, it must communicate a cost? Well, it must be costly. And it communicates because it, it's costly. Now, that is the way that some people represent the handicap principle, but it's actually not the way we use cost in a regular sense. So doing exactly what everybody else is doing, for example, running 100 meters at the Olympic Games rather than riding, running 92 meters at the parking lot, that doesn't seem like there's a cost to it. But anytime you do what everybody else is doing, you are opening yourself to comparison. And when you open yourself to comparison, you risk being compared poorly. And so in that sense, running the 100 meters, right, wearing the tuxedo to the Academy Award can be seen as a cost as because you're now opening yourself to, be, to comparison. Right. Okay. Yeah, I think about people who go to dance clubs or something, nightclubs, just being there, they're displaying a cost that, they're allowing themselves to be compared to other people in the nightclub, you know, if they're, if it's a meat market kind of a place. For sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so 
in in a sense we would normally we would not call that costly but within the context of the handicap principle being similar to everybody else and therefore comparable is actually uh can also be seen as as a cost okay right so now we need to uh, we, we talked about why the, all the men in the academy awards all dress exactly the same or similar to the, to an outsider would think they dressed exactly the same but they themselves would know that they dress similarly to not be the same. But what about the women in the Academy Awards? And there you see uh, that what gets synchronized is not the dress, right? Because they're all dressed in different dresses, um, is that it's within a genre or within a, 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 a you know, it's a nightgown. Um, fancy, fancy dress with glitter on it. Yeah, or, or whatever, but there what gets, gets uh, uh, synchronized is a certain level of creativity wow. in the dress and certain, certain level, but it, that it cannot, they, so they cannot come dressed as a Chinese peasant from the 16th century because then they would not be comparable in any way, right? <laughs> yeah. But they, so they need to conform and wear a nightgown, but what they need is to be a, a, the right amount of creativity and, and flashiness in the nightgown, but that's not too much. Right. Yeah. Interesting. So, so, um, so to be specific, the, as I am in high school and I'm not wearing jeans, mm -hmm. I am trying to signal. So one of two things. So either you fail signaling that you can get jeans or you can get your parents to buy you jeans. Yeah. Or you're signaling that you're so cool, you don't need jeans. Right, I'm above it. Yeah. I'm, a, I'm beyond, I'm beyond jeans. I'm in the next phase of, of, of fashion or something. And I'm also trying to communicate a cost that I have the ability to spend time and energy in something that would be so much easier if I just wore blue jeans. I'm trying to communicate that I... Yeah have extra resources to spend on fashion in this manner trying yeah. to communicate to other people like i've got my shit together so well that i can even spend a tremendous amount of energy in this kind of random thing yeah and sure. that makes me uh, well that i'm trying to communicate i'm trying to commute or i'm trying to get people to see me as someone who is um either a, a, a sexual partner that they would want to have or someone that they should accept into their ranks because mm. of, for tribal, you know, acceptance. Yeah, or they, they, would, they would want to be a friend or they, they would want to be you, you know? Right. Right. Yeah. And, but I'm not necessarily trying to, I'm not necessarily an antelope jumping up and down, trying to communicate to a predator not to kill me. No. Well, the, the, <laughs> if, if uh, uh, although I will if, say I did if a bully parties. if a bully beats up the people without who don't wear jeans, then wearing the jeans is like the stoning is signaling that I'm one of the ones that you, you know don't pick on me pick on, on the other person. Yeah, that's interesting uh, because there were times when I would go to other other. So in my community, I knew I grew up in the same neighborhood my entire life, so uh, no one messed with me i guess because they knew me and mm -hmm. i don't know they for whatever number of reasons i mean occasionally i was bullied but not in high school but when i went in high school i'd go to other communities other cities and go to parties and stuff and and i would be dressed as as a complete so it wasn't just jeans i would i would wear very strange outfits <laughs> and my uh, and so there was this one time I remember I was on Mercer Island, which is just a, a town nearby. And this humongous guy w was telling me he was going to, he was, he was describing to me how he was going to rip my head off. He was like, I'm going to take your head and I'm going to smash it into that stove over there. And then I'm going to throw you out the window and then I'm going to stomp on your head. Like he was just describing. And I just <laughs> remember looking at him like, and I, so at that moment, I guess we could get back to this to this handicap thing. I was trying to communicate to him that I was so tough or something that he wasn't he wasn't making me afraid. I was just looking back at him like, "Oh, interesting." So so then what would you do? <laughs> <That's> <laughs> so <laughs> and so, so he was trying to signal to everyone else that, you know, he's he's the I don't know, some kind of super tough guy and 
that he has worth in that way or something. So in, in that situation, uh, and this is another example that, that Zahavi gives, um, if you t told them, um, if you talked back, and, and but you did it in a low voice, and, you, and that's a voice that only a calm person can speak in a low voice. Right. Right. If you're really stressed that he's going to beat you up, you're going to reply in a high voice. So if you said, uh, oh, yeah, well, let's see you try. Or if you said, oh, yeah, well, let's see you try. <laughs> Those are, <laughs> everybody can do the latter, which yeah. is why it's not impressive. Right. Only some people can remain calm and speak with a low voice. Right. And I even took it to another level and I just, tried to make a joke out of it, but I, I'm telling you, man, I was terrified. I, I was fairly <laughs> sure he you was probably going. could not have spoken with a low voice. Yeah. And I, and I'm trying ending. to get the attention of my friends who are across the room and I'm like, um, you know, so it was, it was a conundrum cause I couldn't, I couldn't, I couldn't let him know I was trying to get my, the attention of my friends cause that would let him, you know, think mm -hmm. that I was afraid. And yeah. So um, now, and another yeah. thing that you could do is that you can throw your arms back, you know, put your chin out and say, oh, yeah, let, hit me, you know. Yeah. And that would be a handicap because that's the wrong thing to do to give them right. a your hands. Yeah, back. That explains that whole thing where people do that a lot. Like, go ahead, you know, hit me or. or yeah. Even in, in but that's that's why me. it's impressive. Yeah. And that you, you're the you're the antelope that jumps up. Oh yeah, you're gonna chase me. Oh, I'm gonna get myself tired first. Let's see, uh, uh, and I'm still gonna be able to run away from you. Ah, uh, so in that instance, um, and I was wearing a pretty ridiculous outfit that <laughs> I, I don't blame him for trying to beat me up. But um, my speaking calmly and and almost joking with him was me jumping up and down, saying like, "Look, I." I, I've got so much calmness. I'm not afraid of you. Don't Go pick on someone me. else. Yeah, because you know, would I be so calm if if I thought I couldn't take you? You know, or mm -hmm. I thought I couldn't exactly. hold my own. You know. Yeah. There was no way I was going to hold my own. That guy. He was gigantic. <laughs> I mean, I'm a pretty yeah. tall guy too. So it's like he he was just I don't even know where he came from, but he was like the mountain kind of a thing. Uh huh. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. So, so that Sorry. explains a lot of behavior. You just explained a lot of human behavior. Yeah. Well, an animal behavior. And, and, animal and, behavior. and he will show you that communication, that there's handicaps between in pheromones with, uh, you know, worker bee communicating with the queen bee. I mean, there's a lot of different uh, um, uh, talk about the handicap principle, but a lot of people don't, don't fully understand some of the nuances. Yeah, I the I don't know if this is the same, but I remember reading about squirrels or birds that will show off by putting themselves in danger. Oh yeah, and yeah, uh, for sure. to, to signal to their fellow, uh, you know, species that they can handle such a thing. They'll you know, yeah. Like, uh, so like that a bird will come down to the ground and sit next to a hyena or something, and yeah. And, when the hyena comes up, they run away and they do it over and over again, you know? The, the Zahavi, who, the, the guy who came up with this, he's an ornithologist. He's a, a, a bird biologist and, uh, or, or bird behavior. Um, uh, that's, uh, he's, he's a biologist, but he, he, he's a behavioral biologist. Um, and he would observe birds that are not just... <laughs> Not just uh, that, that there'll be a, a bunch of them, they're trying to get closer, they're inching towards this hawk that is standing further away. And, and yeah, he could not comprehend why would they get closer and closer to this hawk. What would make sense? But that's why he came with the handicap principle. So they're showing off to the other birds. Now, this ties into a bunch of evolutionary uh, discussion regarding altruism. So if you have a bird that signals when it sees a predator, so it starts making noise, warning all the other birds that the predator is coming, that bird who makes the signal is uh, putting itself at risk, right? When there's a predator around, you don't want to draw attention. Right. And so that was seen as altruistic behavior, and that was seen as, you know, Richard Dawkins or, or Hamilton before him would explain that as a selfish gene explanation, right? But with the handicap principle, you don't need 
the selfish gene. You just need the, the, the display to be uh, uh, observed and uh, uh, to to uh, have a, a credibility or a, a, a social hierarchy that you get, uh, you impress your other members of the group by acting altruistically, right? Right, right. So if someone like R Richard Dawkins or, or someone who believes in the, the selfish gene stuff would say that uh, when two brothers are walking down the, by the river and one of them falls into the river, the other one needs to calculate how much relatedness they have, right, and, and the risk, and that would determine whether or not they jump after their brother to save him, right? I don't know if you heard that kind of argument, right? There's nothing I wouldn't do for two brothers or eight cousins. I, no, I haven't heard about that. Okay. But that's the selfish gene kind of explanation. Now, Zahavi would tell you that if you have two brothers and one falls in, that's one thing. But what about if there's a, a, third, a third brother, right? Then that may changes everything. Now you want the other brother to jump in. Now the, the math becomes very, very messy. But also, there's a big difference whether or not you're going to jump in or not jump in based on how many people are watching you, right? So if your altruistic behavior is observed and impresses other people, that's a very different thing than acting altruistically when you're not observed. Right. So the, to me, it seems philosophically like it can all be tied back to, I, I guess, what I would phrase as a selfish gene in that we're all trying to, you know, all these urges that we have are related to survival, right? And propagation. Yeah, but that's a selfish person. Of our genes, right. And so. That's when, not a selfish gene. Selfish oh, okay. gene is not, is not a selfish person. So it's, it can be in the context of just survival, but in this case, it is also survival mediated through communication and reputation. Exactly, right. Yeah. That's but what I that's, was to say. You took the words right out of my mouth. <laughs> but that's a big difference between uh, ignoring communication and reputation and with, uh, uh, with, with accepting that it plays a big role in, in this aspect of, you know, but of right. course it ties to survival. And your idea or this idea is so much more complex but accurate than just looking at DNA. Yeah, or, or saying that, yeah, we, we want to help our family because we share genes. Right. It's, uh, um, yeah, and, and hopefully if you, if you think about the handicap principle enough, you'll start seeing it everywhere, you know, it's, uh, and, and, also the, the nuances. So the Catholics can be proud that they have the prettiest churches and the Jews can be proud that their synagogues aren't pretty. Right. You know, they can boast. No, right? Yeah, I see it everywhere. Like I, I'm just looking at my window right now and there's, there's these trees that have been planted a long time ago and they're on, they border uh, between my house and my neighbor's house and just how uniform they are and how yeah. well they've been trimmed and, taken care of and planted a long time ago it's it there's a, a lot of communication in that just looking at that yeah, you know for sure and, and me for living here you know mm -hmm. um the the chairs on my deck and the the style that they're in and the cushions that are on there that i you know that i can um have so, the the sort of time to have cushion management when it starts to rain i have to take the cushions in you know like i'll i'll, I'll give you another example of uh, the, the handicap principle from zahavi and he says that whenever he comes to work at the university the secretary always says to him hello and she always says the same word hello and uh, the reason she always says the same wor word and not the different word every day is that there be he'll be able to compare it so if because it's the same word he can distinguish between hello and hello uh, and various uh, nuances on it. And so uh, the, the and, and he refers to this as the handicap principle. Of course, there is no real cost in the regular sense of the word for saying the same word rather than different words. But I mean, there is a cost because you're reducing your options in a way, you know, so, right. but the fact that you always say the and same word the cost that you're revealing your inner yeah thoughts. you create a similarity and that similarity allows you to see small differences 
right. just like the similarity in the, the tail of the peacock allows the peahen to see small differences. What are the criticisms of this idea? So uh, he first proposed this theory in, in 75 and 77, and he was attacked as it doesn't work by John Maynard Smith. Actually, that attack was the thing that made anybody pay attention to it. But it was uh, uh, not considered to be uh, legitimate uh, when it came out until 1990. And uh, it's, uh, in 1990, a person by the name of Grafen uh, wrote a paper showing that mathematically the handicap principle can work. Okay, So he did all sorts of uh, uh, mathematical models with various assumptions showing that, yes, this handicap principle can actually work. So uh, since then, it has been sort of accepted, but it has been usually used to explain things like uh, uh, sexual displays, right? The animals that are dancing toward, you know, to each other or that they develop large uh, antlers or large tails or you know, very, very distinct colorations. Uh, so that was what, now, the interesting thing is that one of the guiding principles that guided Zahavi is that uh, he thought that uh, a lot of biologists at the time, in the 70s, um, and at that era, uh, they had physics envy, which was very mm -hmm. common at yeah. that time of... Uh, uh, in, in the world, and everybody wanted to be to do math. If you're a, a biologist that does stuff that doesn't require math, then you're not serious, right? And um, uh, a lot of models were were, ba were were built back then. That there were all sorts of evolutionary stable uh, strategies, where you know certain models that at the end they they don't they don't help us because they assume for example, that an animal can either be a hawk or a dove. But animals don't, are not either or, they can decide at different times and they can, you know, they have intelligence, you know, the stuff that's hard to model. So he was driven uh, 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 by a backlash against this math uh, at all costs, right? We must do math if you're serious. And he, he, I, he could not do math also, as many people can't, but he thought that it's fundamentally misguided to think that we must, uh, biology should resemble physics and this mathematical res reduction, low, uh, uh, smaller scales, you know, looking at the genes, looking at molecular biology being better than, um, you know, zoology, for example. Right. So he was against that, and yet uh, he became legitimate when a mathematician showed that uh, uh, that he can build models that can show that the handicap principle work. Well, now, the, and it, it's sort of absurd too, because as you said, he developed a, a mathematical model with a lot of assumptions, right? So you would have yeah. to say like, oh, well, did. yeah, assuming yeah. that, um, you know, I don't even know how to uh, well, know, the, so, a model. I, I have it sort of abstractly in my head, but it's like assuming well, that- Well, he defines cost as a reduction in fitness. He, he what? He, he defined, for his model to prove the, the handicap principle, he defined cost, the handicap, as costly, and that cost as a reduction in fitness. Right. Right, so having a large tail reduces your fitness when compared to the animals that try to hunt you. Right, right. so but there it increases has to be a, your fitness has to be increased, to Right, there has to be some net gain uh, in the in equation. Fitness. Right. But the problem is that fitness is different in different contexts. Right, it's so like sometimes having tattoo is uh, uh, increases your fitness, but sometimes having tattoo decreases your fitness. Right. right. Sometimes so drinking just, vodka just, increases, right. so it's not the fitness is not inherent into the signal. And and there's no it's signal no plus context to, that determines yeah. fitness. Right. So I guess you could you could have that simple equation, you know. Yeah, but I, so I'm critical of the mathematical proof that the handicap principle works. Right, because you would... It, I it, think it works regardless, regardless of the mathematical uh, right, uh, right. model. Uh, yeah, it's because the, I'm guessing that, you know, the model that helped make it legitimate, quote unquote, what again had all these assigned uh, numbers and, you know, yeah. 
and graphs and yeah, yeah and it's just like how do you um how do you know what the mathematical weight of a particular factor is yeah um, and, of course. Yeah. and there's, there's a problem of combining handicaps right so if you have a hundred different handicaps yeah yeah there's there's right your, your nose is pretty your eyes are pretty your hair is pretty but you need to combine those anyway there's 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 it's not not that easy right yeah there's a similar problem in psychology and there has been and uh, physics envy and this oh yeah this. physics envy was was big actually i think yeah. that I, I, I wanted to talk to you either about uh, the handicap principle or the new atheists or you know maybe neoliberals but i think that their story is much more influenced by the physics envy, which is, I think, uh, very, very problematic. Yeah. Well, let's talk about that next time. What do you yeah, say? Yeah, for sure. Yuval. That sounds good. Well, thanks for coming on the podcast, Yuval. This has been fascinating. No problem. Where can people find you on the internet? So I am on Facebook and Twitter, but I do not really participate. So you can message me there and I might see it. Uh, you can also email me at yuvallaor at gmail.com. That's Y-U-V-A-L-L-A-O-R. At gmail.com. Uh, at gmail.com. Yeah. yeah, I encourage people to email Yuval. He is interested in what everyone has to say, as I am. And you can <laughs> email us at contact at psychologyinseattle.com. Your book is going to be titled what? Uh, so the current title is The Awe-Inspired Primate. The Awe-Inspired Primate. Yes. Well, thanks again. You've also been fascinating. And when we have you back on in, I don't know, in a few weeks or so, we'll talk about the new atheists, which I okay. have no idea what that has to do with. And I'm fascinated to hear your <laughs> thoughts on it. Okay. Everyone out there, please take care of yourself because you deserve it. You really do.